Hello, everybody. Welcome to the, um, the March edition of the Toronto Jug. Glad you could all make it, uh, despite our presenter not, uh, not feeling very well today and not being able to, to make it for the presentation, but we have some, some fun stuff tonight anyway. Um, this is our regular housekeeping slide, just to let you know we have a mailing list. If you're not on it, you should sign up because we announce meetings and last minute changes and things like that. Um, Google Plus community, which we post news to, and our videos and things like that all end up there. Um, and our videos, we record all the meetings, uh, post them to our website so you can check them out, download them, share them with your friends, kind of thing. Um, so this was actually a pretty interesting month for Java News. Um, the biggest story, of course, is the actual final release of Java 8. It's available, it's on Oracle's website. Hey, Arn. You can just uh, give it a click and download it. So uh, should all be using it. Um, if you haven't tested your apps with it, this is this is when you should be definitely starting with that because Java Seven will be on its way out. Do and you have any early battle stories for uh, every testing? all of my stuff's worked on Java Eight so far. I haven't run into any any weird. Hey, so if you haven't been following the Java 8 news and you didn't uh, make it to our Java 8 tutorial day, which was super awesome, um, there's lots of language and API changes and get on Oracle's website to check them out and see what's new because there's, there's a ton. Um, and Oracle also did a big webcast on the 25th, and that, that's available on their website, so you can you can watch that. It's uh, it's a little bit dull, but it's it's interesting. It covers all the new new stuff and the roadmap and things like that, so it's worth a look. How long was it? I think it was like two hours or something. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's a bunch of new things that came out to go with Java 8. There's a new spring. Um, and the new ASM framework that goes with it so it can do runtime stuff to Java 8 bytecode and a bunch of new WebSocket stuff in it. Uh, there's a new IDEA version and a new RC that covers the latest in Java 8 stuff. Um, they did a coding support for uh, code completion for streams and better look at streams as you're, as you're writing things. Uh, and they've also added the full Nashorn debugger to it. Which is really cool. So you can develop your JavaScript right into the uh, right idea. Uh, Eclipse kicked out a new version two, so they've got uh, up to 4.4 now. They've got the compiler updated, so it works with Java 8. Um, they've added search and refactoring features for Java 8, so it'll it'll find and can do a little bit of refactoring to Java 8 stuff. It's got a code assist, so you can sort of command space your anonymous inner class and turn it into a, a lambda, <coughs> which is kind of neat. Um, and they've just improved the code formatter and little things like that. There's, there's a huge number of new features, but those are the big ones that relate to Java 8 anyway. Um, also very exciting, the uh, Jcash JSR finished and actually got released and there's a download and I think this may have been the longest running JSR ever. I think it is, yeah. The longest one that actually finished. In so thir 13 years of <laughs> <laughs> incubation and. Uh, Not quite 13 years. <laughs> 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 um, so if you do any caching, uh, ev every th all the frameworks you've been using are probably going to be updated to meet the standard if they're not already. Uh, some of them have just been using it, and I don't think it's changed very much since then. So um, it, not that exciting, really for development, but it's kind of neat that it's actually signed off on and released and out there, finally. Um, this site we've been linking to every month, this Java calendar, it's really cool, go check it out. Um, it's sort of a community thing where people can add their own Java events to it, and um, it gives you a monthly view of what's coming up basically worldwide that has to do with Java, so conferences and talks and 
all sorts of interesting stuff. So bookmark that. Check it out. Um, that's most of what I have. Uh, usually there's some JBoss updates from the crowd because we have a lot of Red Hat. Um, anything? I don't know. You don't know? Ride Milestone 5 came There is support for Java 8 in Oh, there's a patch. That's right. Yeah. Yes. They, they added a new patch. Um, there's, a, there's a NetBeans Java 8 thing, but that's been out for a while. That came out in January, I think, or even before. Right. So that, that, wasn't really, that wasn't really new, but all three major IDEs are all supporting <coughs> Java 8 completely now, so that's not an excuse either. <laughs> no, no excuses. Uh, and speaking of no excuses, um, we're going to go right into RoboCode yes. this month instead of leaving it to the end and running out of time because we've got a couple new robots to try and uh, gonna yeah. check it out. It even works. <laughs>
I, I don't even know if you can get one core phones anymore. So here's a fake example that I just completely contrived and it doesn't really do anything useful. Uh, so for example, there's two, two threads executing within the same class called thread safety. And thread one is busy doing the go until done method where while we're not done, we're gonna process things. Thread two is going to come in and say, we're done now. And it does that by flipping a bit on done and what happens here? Right. Yeah, did I write a test? <laughs> I, I had some drinks with Eric last night and I, th I think I scared him with my testing <laughs> concerns. Um, so no, it turns out it, it, uh, it might never stop because something that the compiler would like to do here, if, if you're in a tight loop doing things, especially if you're not doing any I.O. or other stuff that, that makes the thread go to sleep. Done is probably now in a CPU register on the core that's executing go until done. And there's no reason that it should ever read main memory or even the L1 cache in that CPU. So done may be false forever, according to thread one, even though we flipped it in thread two. Uh, more likely, it will eventually see the new done value, but we don't know when. So I didn't actually get why it should never check the done. Okay. So uh, in thread one, we're executing some code, and once we've done this a few times, the Java uh, just in time compiler is going to compile this into machine code. And it's going to look at this done value and saying, okay, well, we're reading the value of this dot done. And there is a memory location on the heap that represents that. But if we read that memory location from the heap, literally, every time the loop starts over, we could be incurring a huge performance penalty because it costs thousands of times more time to read done out of memory than it does to read it from a register. Yes? Uh, so that's what the volatile keyword uh, Yeah. Yep. That's, that's definitely one way to fix this. And uh, yes, it would be slow. Yeah, the concern that I have is that the compiler can see that that field does mutate. Like, just looking at that code, yep. I can see that there is a way for that field to change. Like, if you can analyzing and see that mm -hmm. all that field never changes, there's no compiler. Right. Sorry? So yeah, not compiler, the compiler <coughs> the code so that has its own sort of copy of the done. Right. So the, that's right. The compiler could do that. <coughs> the information is available in the class file, yeah. but the compiler doesn't do that because it's too expensive to analyze all possible mutators of <coughs> a particular field in a particular class. Yeah. I, all I meant was that it has at least one, right? Right. <laughs> But when the compiler is compiling go until done, it doesn't take into account the finish method. It just says, OK, we're reading this done value. Uh, according to the declaration of the done value, other threads don't mutate it. OK, and here's a less contrived example. This is something I found when I was preparing the presentation. Uh, pro I think the day that I was actually making this slide, I found this. Servlet filters are a uh, fertile ground for thread correctness problems. Um, I'll give you half a minute to read this over and tell me what's wrong with this servlet filter. Remember the hint at the beginning that web servers have more than one thread. Oh, <laughs> sorry, yes, it's small. Yes, Dan got it. Uh, the pending requests collection is not a synchronized collection, and the do filter method is pretty much guaranteed. Even if you only have one web browser hitting your server, this do filter method is going to be executed multiple times concurrently. Because web browsers open, it used to be up to two, now it's up to six or 10 or something, concurrent requests to the web server at the same time. 
And so this do filter method is going to be processing multiple requests from the same client at the same time. And we are trying to check if there's any pending requests for this current session, which there will be. But we're doing that in a hash set that has absolutely no hints for anybody about that it's going to be read and written by multiple threads at the same time. So this thing will work a bit, and then you'll be really surprised when you deploy it into production. Yes, if you're lucky, you'll get concurrent modification exceptions. Yeah. Um, those, are, those are done on a best effort basis, meaning that they don't actually use any synchronization or take into account the memory model when uh, checking for concurrent modification. So it's not guaranteed at all yeah, to be detected. Uh, yeah, that's also, yeah. Good point. Yes, it wouldn't happen. It wouldn't happen because the iterator does that. Yeah, absolutely true. That's correct. Yes. Yes, if you have a lot of. Yeah, absolutely. If you have a lot of concurrent requests, it will, it will rehash the map while there's still stuff reading and writing the map, and then you will lose pending requests. Absolutely. And those, those will lead to mysterious memory leaks and mysterious uh, pending requests saying that it's not pending even when it is. Because uh, even when the rehash loses a value, the, the garbage collector doesn't know that, that that value is lost and all of the memory that was. Right. Yes, yeah. we'll, we'll get to that, and we can pick it apart because I don't make any guarantees that I'm right about this. It's very hard to do this. Um, so coming back to the memory model question from, from that high-level example to how the JVM actually makes guarantees to your code, there's this happens before thing that reminds me of reading like Isaac Asimov robot novels with the laws of robotics. Uh, this is the contract that you have between your code and the Java compiler. Um, it's all phrased around this happens before relationship. So every action in a thread happens before every action in that thread that comes later in the program order. So that's the I don't care about the memory model because I only have one thread case. As long as every statement in your program happens before every statement that comes after it. So that's kind of obvious, I guess. Yes. But this is in a thread, a thread, not more than one thread. So this gives you the semantics you would expect from a program that does one thing after the other, as long as it only has one thread. So this is not a surprising rule. Now, now we get into the things that uh, you have to worry about when you have more than one thread. An unlock on a monitor. So monitor, that's, that's the technical term they use for uh, a synchronized block in Java. Uh, an unlock on a monitor, which means leaving a synchronized block, happens before every subsequent lock or entering of the synchronized block on that same monitor. So now this involves potentially many threads. So when one thread leaves a synchronized block, that is guaranteed everything that came before it in the program listing, your source code, has happened now according to what threads entering that same monitor can see. Uh, notice that it doesn't say that this is true if one thread leaves a synchronized block and another thread enters another synchronized block. We still don't make any promises there. So you have to be entering and exiting the same synchronized block to get that guarantee. Otherwise, there's like maybe you'll see what the other thread wrote, or maybe you won't. And here's where we come to volatile fields, because somebody asked about that. This is a very similar rule. A write to a volatile field happens before every subsequent read of the same volatile, not other volatile, same. So if you change the value of a volatile, not just that volatile's value, but everything you did before it, whether or not it was volatile, is now guaranteed to be visible to other threads after they've read that volatile. Um, 
This one's another obvious one. A call to thread.start on a thread happens before any actions in the started thread. So anything that a thread writes, you won't be able to observe that until you've called thread.start. And everything a thread has done happens before you call thread.join on that thread. So all of its business is completed when you join it. There's no leftover writes that you can't see once you've joined a thread. So is that clear? I mean, it's kind of a bit technical the way they wrote it, but does that all make sense? Oh, that's right. Um, we, we have certainly observed in, in many Java code bases that there's this sort of magic fairy dust effect where if something's not quite right, if you just keep adding volatile keywords to random fields and random classes, <laughs> you can just, it's like magic fairy dust. Eventually, it'll pass the tests, and you can ship it. <laughs> That's, that should have been the sixth bullet point here. <laughs> they didn't write, I don't know why they didn't write that in the, in the JLS. But. OK, so coming back to this, somebody suggested, let's make done volatile magic fairy dust. It's good. So in this case, this does work, but why? 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 Why does it? You resynchronize the DOM when you, whenever you check it again and again. So you basically synchronize with main memory. Right. So thread two writes to done, and that write, we we have a promise. The write happens before this read, and that's the promise. That's the reason that it works. Also because it's magic fairy dust, but th there's actually there's another rule that covers that too. And the realistic example revisited. So we can think about this. I'm not claiming I'm right, but I think we've used a concurrent hash set, and the concurrent hash set works in the program code. It's, it works the way you would hope because it causes a happens before relationship when you read or write the set. So we say there is a pending request if adding this session ID to the set does not add it to the set because the, the, there was something in the set already. So we have a promise from this concurrent hash set that it didn't have that session in it already. Will it work? Does anyone remember uh, if it does synchronization? The concurrent hash set? No. It, well, it does. It, you incur the cost of that. Uh, all the code that came before this can't be shuffled. It can't be reordered by the compiler to come after that, because inside of this concurrent hash set add call, there is a happens before relationship that gets invoked. So the compiler is constrained. If, even if it inlines the call to add, it's not allowed to move stuff that came earlier to come after. And it also has to have all the memory visibility guarantees that we were talking about in the happens before relationship. So. Mm -hmm. And another thread is before the line pending request got removed. So then there the would be a pending request, right? The, I'm not sure I understand the reason for pending request, what does it mean, the meaning of pending request. But let's say you're removing it first, and then you go through the picture. Yeah. Is, is this correct behavior? I'm just asking. I'm, I'm not sure. I think, is this kind of, I think you're right. But this kind of thing, you need to do reference counting. You're right. Uh, yeah. uh, Seems like yes. It's, it's not the right code. I'm not yeah, sure. Oh, you're yeah. right. Yeah, I agree with you now. So yeah, probably this code. Yeah. Is yeah, I think reference counting would be required here. This is code I actually have to fix for real. So. I didn't. I didn't write the original. I just have to make it work now. That's your fix, right? 
All right, reference counting. <laughs> reference counting with a collection that guarantees thread visibility <laughs> between reads and writes. You can't charge after 6 o'clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, and then, yes, finally, as Dell asked right at the beginning, uh, this whole thing has been a bit too little too late because it's still, it's still a hard problem. I still don't know all the answers for sure. And there's a new JDK enhancement proposal to update the Java memory model and change the rules a bit. And this doesn't include any of that stuff, but you know, coming soon. So if that break existing code that relies no, I don't believe it will break existing code. I think it's fine tuning the existing contract. All my double check locking will still work? Yeah, <laughs> we hope so. That was the reason for the previous update, was to make the double check locking pattern work. Yep. All right, so that's all I've got for now. Further talks on this topic would be greatly appreciated from anyone who uh, wants to. Great. So now we can uh, talk and drink beer and stuff. <laughs> <laughs>